When I say the Red Wedding, I would imagine most of white America knows what I'm talking about. Now, how about if I say the Red Summer? Anyone? Well, let me paint a picture for you. As you can imagine, just like the Red Wedding, the Red Summer was painted in blood. But it was painted with the blood of hundreds of black men, women, and children. Do I have your attention now? You certainly got my attention. <laughs> Looking lovely tonight. Oh, I thank you. Come on. I'm Richard Thomas. And I'm Tiffany Thomas. And we want to welcome you to the Lionheart Institute podcast. It is all about Black History Month this Absolutely. month. Absolutely. And uh, we certainly would both agree, I think, right, that uh, black history is not to be limited to a month. No, absolutely not. That it should be included and taught in American history. Well, right? it is American history. It is the story of our lifeblood, how this yeah. nation was formed and created. And most people don't recognize how deep the wounds go and yeah. how high the glory goes and what African Americans have really contributed to the history and the building of this great nation. Yeah, right? I agree. And uh, we find ourselves right now in some pretty heated times in the world in, in, in American history, right? Oh, for sure. We find ourselves um, rioting at the Capitol. Yeah. We see white people walk in the streets and we see white on white crime on the increase. It's, it's, <laughs> right. it's, it's, it's a horrible thing to say. I know. <laughs> Listen, everybody, I did school assemblies for years and uh -huh. years and years. And uh, one thing I learned very early was that people would rather be entertained than educated. It's true. But if you can get them to laugh, you can get mm -hmm. them to learn. Right. And uh, so today we are taking on a pretty uh, hard topic to talk about in some senses. Yeah. Because there's a lot of crossover to what's going on in the world today. Yeah. Right? You have riots. Those yeah. riots in a lot of ways are party. We're calling them party based. Mm -hmm. We're calling it Republican versus Democrat. Yes. But fundamentally at the, at the, at the very roots of what it's all about, it's all about this outcry against black American lives. Yeah. Right. It's all about all all lives matter. Oh yeah. Versus Black Lives Matter. Yeah. Right? And uh, oftentimes we've painted this picture of African Americans being violent in their protests, mm -hmm. um, causing riots and outbreaks of crime. Right. But if we study the true history of of America, violence has always broken out in white organized. <laughs> Mobs. Protest mobs. Well, let's call them right. what they are. They're mobs. And uh, so that's really what we're going to kind of visit today a little yeah. bit is some of the most famous in American history. Right. Well, you know, as we, you know, like last week, we kind of talked about what we felt was important um, within the black history that hasn't really been shared at all or in the truest sense of the form. And, and so we really talked about what we want to talk about. You know, what, what topic do we feel needs to have some light shed on it? And I realized that I knew pretty much nothing at all about the Red Summer. Which is, it's pretty amazing that we don't teach this as fundamentally part of our, <laughs> right. of our education system. You know, yeah. I, I grew up in the inner city of Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. I grew up around diversity. But it's, it's interesting. We didn't really teach the story of diversity in our schools. Right. right? I moved to Kent, Washington mm -hmm. um, back in the 80s where... The only thing black in my neighborhood was a black Angus cow was about it and me, right? right? I think there was <laughs> six of us at my junior high and maybe seven or eight of us at our high, my high school, mm -hmm. um, people of color that, that we would call us. And uh, it wasn't until I got to college that I even began to think that there was a possibility of a different history that yeah. I'd been taught, right? I'd, I'd heard about roots. We'd had to watch that. <laughs> right, we all got to watch that. Right, but I yeah. didn't understand the complexity mm -hmm. of the role African Americans have re had really played in the development of our nation. Yes. I didn't really understand the extent of violence um, caused against us or that we had to endure. I didn't really understand the, the heights and breadths and widths of our accomplishments, yeah. right? And so here we come off of one of the biggest accomplishments in world history, World War One. Mm -hmm. We're coming back to America. Yeah. Right? Um, 
not only white people, but African Americans who went to war. Mm -hmm. So what was it that really caused the Red Summer of 1919? Well, when you look at all of a sudden there was this increase of black men coming back from the war and communities started overflowing with black men that weren't there before, uh -huh. you know, or hadn't been there for a long time. And white Americans started to feel very insecure. They started to f uh, have a lot of fear build up in uh, job security, home security, um, all these things that they were concerned that, that, that the black populations was going to start overflowing into them. And so uh, some resentment started to build there and it ultimately became a ticking time bomb. I've, I've tried to t talk to people from the very foundations of race relations mm -hmm. that when you talk about racism, you really have to understand the concept of racism is a mental disease that was introduced into the psyche of the world as a class mm -hmm. based structure. Right. right. You have to be mentally ill to really evaluate a person based on their, their skin tone. Right? right. To put them in, in, in a category based on that. Yes. Well, how it is used is exactly what you're talking about and stirring the fear. Yes. Right. Is that all of these African-Americans are going to now steal our jobs. Right. Or we use that same concept and let's build a wall. Yeah, right. The Mexicans sure. are, are <laughs> yeah. stealing our jobs. Well, I, I mean, no disrespect this way because... Mexican community is well known, documented as some of the hardest working people on yeah. the planet, right? Um, they're doing jobs that most of us wouldn't want. No, right? not at all. And I respect that, yeah. right? So when you start to begin to create this fear, this mm -hmm. illusion that now this African American community that's coming into our society, there is that animosity that's burst because the upper class are able to manipulate that yeah. to cause there to be a dissension between people that really should be cooperating mm -hmm. for gain right? rather than uh, at war and at odds with each other. So there's these odd, this odd, this stirring of hate that's beginning right. to be preached and talked about. Yeah. And, and talk a little bit about what that led to. Well, uh, part of that actually stemmed from the resurgence of the KKK. So they had been kind of dormant for a while. And in the summer of, uh, well, in the year of 1918, we saw a huge rise of them. Uh, there was over 60 reported lunches from them in 1918. No doubt. In 1919, there was over 80 reported lunches from the KKK. So the truth is they kind of started to fuel that fire, that hate, that division between blacks and whites. That us versus them. Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. So they definitely added to that. Um, and then you saw races or sorry riots break out there was reported over 25 riots across wow. the united states in 1919 um predominantly the biggest ones um that caused the most chaos and death were washington dc knoxville tennessee longview texas philip county arkansas omaha nebraska and chicago so those were the biggest cities that had the most riots mm -hmm. now Essentially, like I said, this was like a ticking time bomb, and it finally exploded on July 27th, 1919 in Chicago. Now, at the time, um, Chicago beaches were still segregated, right. and there was a young black teenager who was 17 years old, um, and he unfortunately decided to swim, and he floated across the invisible boundary lines. Of, that moved depending on the day, of yes, course, and the population. Yes, so he the unofficial barriers of the black and the white sides, he crossed over, he was floating around, and... Um, there was a group of white men, and one of the white men picked up a, sto a rock and started stoning this kid. So um, essentially, one of these rocks um, hit this young boy in the head and knocked him out, and he fell in water, and he drowned. And nobody bothered to save him. So what happened was, after his death, of course, the black community was very upset, mm -hmm. and they demanded justice. Sure. But based on the eyewitnesses they knew the gentleman who had instigated the stoning and of course he was not arrested he was not charged with the death of this young teenager nothing well you talk about the kkk and it's kind of difficult obviously when you have the insurgents of <laughs> right. they are us right? yes you've got police officers that are, that are putting on the the, uh, the sheets yeah. you've got neighbors that are putting on the sheets you've got fathers who are dressing their sons in it and so all of a sudden now in, in, a, in a white governed world, you have people that have gone militia style, yeah. right? Or a hate group, which mm -hmm. is pretty indicative of what's seeming to happen yeah. in the world today. It is, for um, sure. And uh, it's very difficult to bring justice 
to those to who who are in charge of bringing that justice. Right. Well, ultimately, there there was a group of black and white uh, protesters, and they, of course, came together on the beaches of Chicago, started clashing. That carried over, and essentially, that carried into four days of rioting. Um, so riots, shootings, beatings, and arsons all took place over a four-day period in Chicago. At the end of that, um, there was 15 white people that were dead. There was um, 23 black people that were dead and more than 500 people that were injured. And most of those were predominantly black people. It's heartbreaking, but you, you look at it. These are, in many cases, African-Americans who had gone abroad, yeah. right? Had risked their lives. Right. Some for, of these were veterans, yeah. For freedoms mm -hmm. that they were fighting desperately for people in different countries. Yeah. And they're coming back to a world where they're not honored nearly in the same way that they, they risked their lives yeah. to protect for others. Well, in addition to that, the white mob actually burned down more than a thousand black homes in the community as well. Um, President Woodrow Wilson at the time publicly blamed white people uh, for the riots, for inciting them um, in, in Chicago and D.C. However, nobody, of course, was arrested. Nobody was charged for any of these um, as far as from the white community. Mm -hmm. um, nobody essentially was blamed for any of this. Sure. And then we took responsibility. True. Right. And then you saw, again, you know, so that started the whole Red Summer. And then it continued to progress across the United States and Arkansas. Um, over a three-day period, we saw a, a mob of white people lynch 97 My black God. people in their community. They killed over 200 men, women, and children, all because the black sharecroppers wanted to start a union to provide better work environments for the black employees. Again, we, we see a, a theme, right? Yes. Driving consistent truth. People organizing to end classism, that is really where you see hell break out. Right. right, and because of that, a white mob killed over 200 people. Oh Again, there was no justice for these right. people. It was just basically wiped off the map and people started over and ignored that it was ever there. I mean, but, this is just a But you a can't handful. ignore that, right? So it's, no. it's burned into the psyche of, of, your, of your nation. And so right. we're not teaching this history, mm -hmm. but the wounds of this history right. is still growing and festering. As a, 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 as a disease in our society. Right. right. And ultimately, again, multiple riots. These are just a few that were just horrific um, th throughout the Red Summer. And this ultimately led into what we know today as the Tulsa Race Massacre. And of course, the Tulsa, Tulsa mm -hmm. the, the community that we're going to talk about, we often hear laughter around the concept of giving my 40 acres and a meal. Right. right? There are many, many, many African-American historians and people even currently who say, hey, integration has never worked for us. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, yeah. Tearing down the walls of segregation has never worked for us. Actually, when we've been left alone to really thrive in our own communities, to really build our own communities, we've done the best Right. Ever. Right. Yeah, so, true. so the the sad reality is we have now a, a community in Tulsa, mm -hmm. right, that has essentially segregated itself. Yes. Right. Has essentially said, "Hey, we're going to have black markets. We're going to have black dentists. We're going to begin to build the things in our community that are necessary mm -hmm. for us to thrive." I read a a startling and heartbreaking report. I think it was in Forbes. Uh, I encourage you to look it up if you could. But that the possibility is that by 2053, wealth in the American community could drop to zero. Yeah. Meaning <laughs> that the total collapse of economic household wealth could go to zero. Now, right now, we're at 30% of what the average Caucasian home has. That's crazy. We're doing fairly well when it comes to average income and, and monthly wages and so mm -hmm. forth. We're up to about 70 and projections are that we'll get to 80 and right. potentially keep growing. But by 2053, if the trend doesn't change of us as a community protecting our own wealth, saving money, buying stores, becoming mm -hmm. in involved in entrepreneurships, becoming doctors and lawyers over our own practices that our community will drop to zero in contrast of yeah. wealth. And that's staggering. It's, it's, yeah. it's heartbreaking. Right. So here we have Tulsa. They're doing extremely well, mm -hmm. right? 
which provoked anger in the community, Mm -hmm. start to explain what happened and how really it was just a trigger for the excuse of violence. Right. So, you know, as you mentioned earlier, you know, World War World War One had just recently ended. You know, so that all these you know black soldiers were coming back home. Um, racial tensions were spiking because of it. Um, and in 1921, Tulsa became a prosperous place because of oil. Mm-hmm. So they had oil money, and so they were growing, they were prosperous. Um, they had a population of over 100,000 people, with around 10,000 of them being black residents. Okay. Um, interesting enough, after the Civil War, Oklahoma actually became a safe haven for black slaves. Mm-hmm. And so, it, be- so th- it became a large black community um, because they felt safe there and they mm-hmm. could prosper there. And so... Um, and as you mentioned, most of the black residents lived in Greenwood, was was their community. Um, and it, of course, has also been known as um, Black Wall Street, mm-hmm. it became. Um, and so between 1865 and 1920, more than 50 black townships were founded um, in Oklahoma. It's powerful. Right. And then in 1906, a black wealthy landowner by the name of O.W. Gurley... Um, Mr. Right. He purchased 40 acres of land mm-hmm. and he named it Greenwood. Come on, Greenwood. So, um, Gurley loaned money <clears throat> to people of color, allowing them to open their own businesses, something that had not been done before. Right. Um, and of course, th- we, we see a lot of that even today. You know, unfortunately, African Americans not being able to buy homes, not being able to get loans to purchase businesses, and, and that greatly affects the ability to prosper in mm-hmm. communities. So, this gentleman believed in um, giving, raising up his community. So, he, he loaned money for people to open businesses. Um, there was also another predominantly uh, black entrepreneur by the name of J.B. Stratford, who was born in slavery in Kentucky. Powerful story. Right. And Look it he, up. He moved to Greenwood. Now, he built the biggest, most luxurious hotel ever owned by a black man in the United States of America. So, he built a 55-room hotel Come on. Um, in Greenwood because he also believed that a black community had a better chance of economic progress by pooling resources together mm-hmm. as a community. Right. So for over a decade, Greenwood just flourished um, and the black community prospered. Uh, on Greenwood Avenue, there was so many amazing businesses. So we had everything from luxurious shops to restaurants, grocery stores, hotels, jewelry and clothing stores, movie theaters, uh, barbershops and salons. They had a library, pool halls, nightclubs, and offices for doctors and lawyers and dentists. Yeah. They also had their own school. They had their own post office, they had a savings and loan bank, they had their own hospital, and their own bus and taxi service. You'd be hard pressed to find a community like that today. Right. right? They say that um, for an African American to keep his dollar in his own community, Mm -hmm. less than seven hours it would seem. Right. Well, one thing that I think is really important to note, because I know you have talked about this many times in our conversations of the differences between black and white communities predominantly. that it was said that within Greenwood, every dollar would exchange hands 19 times before it left the community. It's powerful. Yeah. Right? Because you have brothers building brothers, sisters building yes. sisters. You have a community building itself by sticking together. Right? Yes, because money is continuing to go back into it. Right. So it allows everybody to prosper. And so now we have, we're, we're discussing the stimulus package. We'll be coming into <laughs> right. that, right? Right. And what's the purpose of it, right? Well, it's mm-hmm. to stimulate the, econ- the economy. Healthy things happen when you have a stimulated economy, right? right? Less violence. Crime goes down. So there's a lot of people that talk now about about black crime, right? Mm-hmm. Um, in the black community, right. right? Well, obviously, we find out as we study redlining and yeah. so forth. We study events like the Tulsa massacre. Mm-hmm. We find out how the black community was really driven, formed, shaped, mm-hmm. economically deprived, and so right. forth, right? But when you have a community now where that dollar doesn't exchange at all within the right. in the community, right? You have people that are desperate mm-hmm. to find an economic means. Yeah. Wherein at one point 
19 times. Yeah, that's, that's powerful. That's you know, so powerful. There's a the simple song is this, you know, we play dice in our own community. Right. Right. And the reality of it is don't play the lottery. Mm-hmm. Although if you play the lottery and you win, <laughs> break me off a little. All right. <laughs> but um, really, it's play dice in your own community. Yeah. Not to speak or, or glorify gambling, mm-hmm. but let's keep that dollar within, yeah. within our communities as long as possible. And that's how we begin to cause our, our communities to flourish. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we have the whole um, issue of, of foreign interaction with our businesses mm-hmm. and so forth. We want to bring, gov- we want to bring business home. Right. Yeah. We want manufacturing to come back home. We want to support our communities and we want those dollars to stay in house. Right. right. As long as possible. And that's yeah. that's wisdom. And that's where some of the best of our leadership. Yeah. We really need to press for our leadership to rise that understands that economic cycle. Yeah. So that we can begin to educate and that tax dollar, another important part of it, <laughs> right. which wasn't as quite as important then because they were building their own schools out of their right. own own common sense yeah. but now if we have that dollar communi- um circulating 19 times within our own community mm-hmm. that's 19 people paying da- taxes on that dollar yep. which means that now we have a stronger economic base to do schools yeah. to do medical facilities and so forth for our community mm-hmm. so we're talking about about um unfortunately right now black history month the tearing down of communities right however really what we need to begin to do is we need to begin to get strategists people much smarter than myself that sit together and really strategize on how to keep the dollar within our communities to build our communities up. For sure. Right? Well, Oklahoma started to see a real change at, to where it was no longer be, being that safe haven that it once was when Oklahoma gained their statehood. Mm. And that is when you really started to see uh, things become a little bit more difficult for the black residents in Greenwood. Um, Come down to that tax dollar. It does. And, um, of course, the Jim Crow laws really came in hardcore when, when Oklahoma became a statehood. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the, the poll taxes, the literacy tests, of course, continued. And then, of course, the the presence of the KKK began to... to um, so that anger and that fear among the white communities. And I mean, let's be honest, when when you're dealing, um, especially with, let's say, the poor white people in, in Tulsa, and it's hard enough to, to accept the rich white people that you got to look up to, you got to work for, you see sure. them enjoying their life. But for the poor white community in Tulsa to look down the street and see black people who were living far better lives than them, who, you know, were, were prospering. And these poor white people looked at this and, and thought, how dare these people who are beneath me have a better life than me? And that's all based on the indoctrination of hate. Yes. Right? It's all based on this, this race theory that truly that black people were born to be inferior, yes. which is part of the indoctrination and the teaching of history mm-hmm. that we allowed in our country, right. right? We allowed voices of hate rather than voices of education mm-hmm. and voices of power to become our educators. And what we must do now is that we're, we're, we're studying this very truth in a yeah. small community in Utah where they literally would say, we're not going to talk about black history, even during black history month. Right. right? Yeah. So how, what a thief to our society yeah. that not only are we st- stealing some of the most beautiful poetry, some mm-hmm. of the most phenomenal sports and entertainment, not only are we stealing some of the most remarkable stories of, of, of overcoming, but we're stealing the blueprint for building communities and society out of the ashes. Yeah. Right. And by losing that, we lose respect for one another because if if I don't know the true history of mm-hmm. a person, um, then all of a sudden the lie and the deception becomes the only perception that I have of them. Mm-hmm. Right. And so bias rather than truth becomes my barometer of, of gauging your value. Yeah, for sure. You know, so ultimately these kind of all led up to what is now known as the Tulsa Race Massacre. And that happened... Sounds heartbreaking <laughs> just to hear it. Right. Well, it, yeah, it truly is. Um, I have to say that my knowledge of this was greatly limited. Um, before really the last year, 2020 taught me a lot and I learned a lot. Yeah. And prior to that... I had heard of Black Wall Street. Mm-hmm. 
that it was, you know, one of the few prosperous towns sure. that was black residents. But what I heard was that it was the black residents that ultimately burned down their own city from riots. Mm -hmm. You know, which of course continues with the narrative that we are taught today with, you know, black people rioting and right. burning their own communities down. And it's like sure. the whole narrative. So that is what I was taught about Greenwood. I, I didn't, um, that, that was pretty much it. So needless to say, I was quite angry when I actually studied this and learned the truth of, of what really happened. And, and let me say this to my audience, because I think that it's important for us to become self-empowered in the, in the process of learning. Yeah. Yes, I encourage you. I mean, obviously, her relationship in our household causes her to dig deeper, right? Mm -hmm. The reality that she now has mixed children, even though they could certainly pass, <laughs> right? right? Causes her to have that, that internal necessity. Yeah to educate them yeah but the truth of the matter is is we owe it one to another absolutely. to educate ourselves and absolutely in the world that we live in with the internet it is very simple to get to truths mm -hmm. that don't take a lot of effort um a lot of debate of common sense mm -hmm. to figure out where the truth really lies yeah and i encourage each one of you to go on your own quest and begin to kind of search out the true history of america for yourselves mm -hmm. so that you can find the true history and the path to your success and, yeah. and what is is giving you the ability to be successful. For sure. So ultimately, where it led was 1921. Mm. A 19-year-old black shoe shiner by the name of Dick Rowland was accused of sexually assaulting a 17-year-old white elevator worker by the name of Sarah Page. To now, Page. mind you, Miss Page later reported that she was not assaulted and said that she Rollins. came out saying that she wasn't and she never ever claimed that he had done that to her that was something witnesses claimed had happened right and so she did say that she he hadn't done anything to her however that did not stop this poor young man from being arrested mm -hmm. and so when he was arrested um a white mob stormed the sheriff and demanded that they give him over to them Imagine they didn't do that, right? That uh, no, be they did not. So hearing this, 25 black men showed up at the courthouse saying, hey, we're here to protect him uh, from the white mob. And then rumors started going around that a white mob was planning to lynch Roland. And so 75 armed black men, in addition to the 25, showed up at the courthouse. However, when they showed up, they were met by 1,500 white armed men. Now, shortly after that incident at the courthouse on may 31st 1921 with over 18 hours this riot continued and the damage was devastating so an armed white mob including members of the kkk attacked the residents and businesses of greenwood ultimately they burned black wall street to the ground they burned black homes to the ground it was reported that over 1200 houses were burned to the ground from greenwood district and over 200 houses were not burned but completely looted and right. robbed now it had been officially reported that on that day 36 people died 26 of them black and 10 of them were white. Now, decades later, decades later, it was determined that they estimated roughly around 300 black people had died versus the 26 that had been reported. Now, heartbreaking. even further down the road, they are now saying that that number actually could be more than tripled. Mm -hmm for the amount Open graves yes for, yeah. because they created like basically a mass grave and dumped all the bodies as quickly as possible into these graves mm -hmm. so they're they're saying that the the greenwood massacre massacre could actually rival 9-11 is what they're ultimately saying um so now by the time that the national guard and the governor showed up um uh, they had reported that the riot had ended they had arrested over six thousand black men and women um, and detained them in camps however eyewitnesses said that they detained these black residents while the riot still continued right and so they kept them from protecting their businesses from their homes mm -hmm. um that is what eyewitness while said the right they said they, the governor allowed the white mob to continue destruction while they were in camps mm -hmm. Um, of course, that's the unofficial story, but um, that is what witnesses said. Now, I do want to point out that not one person, not one white person 
and Tulsa was charged with any of the murders, with any of the destruction. Not one person. And the truth is, Oklahoma went to great lengths to cover it all up. To, to, when we talk about cover up, mm-hmm. obviously, we we erase it out of history. Yes. Right? And that's the most impactful truth, right? Yes. Is that we take the, the tragic story of what happened mm-hmm. and we begin to act as though it never happened. Now, right. For many people today, if they understood that, they would understand that oftentimes violence occurs as a result of injustice. Yes. Right? Um, when you look at riots and you look at the way that America handled it, white America handled mm-hmm. um, their situations, they've always dealt with it with violence, right? And yet we're called to, in all situations, <laughs> rise above it. Rise above and uh, peaceful yeah. demonstration if non violence. Non violent mm-hmm. if necessary. And, and of course, we realize, even looking at the world we live in today, that we approach a time in American history where that is less and less likely to continue. Right. And I pray that that day doesn't happen. Yeah. Right. We, uh, living in peace is, is our, is all of our goal, but we're all given the second amendment, right. To mm-hmm. defend our families, our homes. And, and, uh, you see more and more people. I love what Dave Chappelle says. You want to see second amendment laws change it's voting right. season. Every black man in America will <laughs> get a gun. Ahead. And uh, y'all vote that out immediately. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. But t- tell me some of the things that are still going on as yeah. far as the cover up. So that when people begin to research it and mm-hmm. they see this, hopefully it'll begin not to, to enrage you in a sense of make you feel guilty or sh- full of shame. Stay proud of who you are, your history and, and, and everything in it. But just the reality of it will be a bridge yeah. to better race relations, better interaction with our, with our, with our fellow man. Well, ultimately, as I said, they they moved very quickly to cover this up. Um, It was rumored, however, that the governor was actually the leader of the KKK in the local area. Um, Right. (laughs) I'm like, that makes sense, actually. Um, So what they did is they literally dug like a mass grave and just threw all the bodies in quickly, buried them. Loved ones were not even allowed to even know what where they were buried. They didn't let anybody know where, where this had happened. Um, you know, it was horrible. People weren't allowed to bury their, their loved ones. They right. weren't allowed to mourn them. And so because of that, the number of, of deaths has never been actually counted. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just an estimate. It's never been official. It's never been official. There's been, you know, of course, what they reported plus... It, the reason why the estimate is so much greater is um, based on the size of the, the grave, grave yeah. um, th- and what they can estimate, um, particularly how many people they think are buried there, and of course the survivors, mm-hmm. the people who still survived, right. um, how many people they believe were killed that day. The really crazy part is that the governor made sure that this was never, ever talked about in Oklahoma's history. Mm-hmm. It was never in any history books. It was never written down on paper about anything. It literally, like, it never happened. It took almost 70 years. Yes. 70 years before, which brought you into 1990s, mm-hmm. before the first mention and rumors of the Greenwood Massacre began to surface. Um, and this actually followed um, the, the Oklahoma City bombing, is actually what started it in the 90s. Um, because of that, so reporters started hearing things left and right, and so they started digging and started researching, and that is actually how they came across the, the, the history of Greenwood. The significant terrorist act that was before Right, happened. right. Yeah. Now, ultimately, a lot of residents, black residents, left Tulsa. They yeah. didn't stay. Right. But there were some that stayed. They actually sued Oklahoma for uh, $1.8 million in damages. Of course, they were awarded nothing. Um, the Green, or sorry, the Green, the Red Cross eventually brought supplies to, to Greenwood to help mm-hmm. them rebuild. Right. Um, of course, the city was the, was never the same after yeah. that. There was no really way to, to rebuild that. Um, but 75 years after the, the Tulsa riots, they actually, um, the story finally broke about the history. Oh. Um, they now have actually narrowed down three potential grave sites where they believe bodies have been buried. Um, and then it took another 20 years before they finally got a mayor willing to exhume the grave sites to actually find these bodies right. and to really make the truth be known and the city held accountable and the true history to come out about what happened. Um, so, you know, now there is a mayor willing to do that. 
um, as of 2019, he has approved uh, for, for that. Of course, they were supposed to do it, but with COVID, that got sure. put off with 2020. So maybe, you know, the next year or two, we'll start to actually see some history being truly reported for the right. first time. Um, and then in, nine, or sorry, in 2018, they actually changed the name of the incident from the Tulsa race riot to the 1921 Tulsa race massacre. Massacre. Yeah. And I think that's healthy. I think it's, yeah. I think once you begin to understand your history, right, you can begin to heal from that history. Yeah, absolutely. Once you begin to heal from that history, you can begin to grow from that history. Right. And I think it's important that we, we recognize, yes, horrible things have happened yeah. in our past. It's been a part of our foundation. However, we've overcome those things. We've triumphed over them. And so us looking hard at our history and taking that painful observation yeah. into our into the truth about what America has been gives us an opportunity to say, you know what? Yes, we may be the best country in the world. Mm. Um, yes, we may be a phenomenal country in the world. Or maybe we're not the country we once thought we were. Yeah. But we have the opportunity to grow into a great nation. And I really believe that, um, you know, that slogan, if you would have just tweaked, tweaked it a little bit, right? Yeah. Make America great instead yeah. of make America great again. Yeah. If we would endeavor to make America great, yeah. that we can truly build a great country. And it begins with being honest yes. and accountable and saying, you know what, let's not um, do this alone. Let's do this together. You know, the really thing that really hit me hard was in, in a two-year span between the Red Summer and Tulsa, over a thousand black men, women, and children were murdered, and nobody was held accountable. Let's not let their deaths go in vain. And I, I look at literally a hundred years later, mm -hmm. and we are still seeing, seeing black men, women, and children murdered, and nobody being held accountable. And... I, it just like that hit me like a ton of bricks and I thought to myself white America we got to wake up and we got to understand why when you say all lives matter that is a slap in the face to every black man woman and child who have suffered in this country it is a slap in the face to humanity because we have caused this suffering in our country and we have erased it from our history because we don't want to be held accountable for it we don't want to look at this and remember what we did in this country we want to act like it never happened but the truth is it did happen this country was built on the blood and bones of african americans people of color died to build this country for us and this is what we've done to them and what we've continued to do to them. So when people say Black Lives Matter, you need to understand where that comes from and why that is so important to understand that phrase. Because for so long in this country, we have proven that their lives do not matter to us. And, not to, and even to make it worse, we erase it from our history. We don't even teach it to anybody. We just cover it up in a mass grave and, and move on like it never happened. But the truth is it did happen and until we recognize these things, until we see Black History Month no longer a month, but part of our American history, we are going to continue to repeat the sins of our forefathers. We are going to repeat the sins of our past, which is proven to be very violent. And I, for one, am ready for some peace and I am ready for truth. And I am ready for unity in this country for the first time in our American history. You guys, thank you so much for tuning in today. This has been a impactful, meaningful, and shareable episode of the Lionheart Institute podcast, sharing the tragic truth of the Tulsa massacre. Yeah. And uh, while it's hard to, it's a hard pill to swallow. Yeah. It's one that should be shared so that we can awaken as a nation yep. and really fulfill what we hope to fulfill, which is to become the greatest country in the history of the Absolutely. world. Absolutely. Right. God bless you. I'm Richard Thomas. And I'm Tiffany Thomas. And we want to say thank you for being a part of this episode. Like, share, comment, and uh, get involved. Be sure to subscribe. Hit that bell Please. so you don't miss out on any notifications. Tell your friends and family to su subscribe. We love you guys. Thanks for being part. See you soon. Bye-bye.